Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome everybody back to AA. Uh, I know this is uh, a little bit uh, unusual circumstance. A lot of people couldn't make it. Uh, Brett was supposed to uh, give introduction, but he's stuck in the US, uh, so he couldn't come back. And I know a lot of uh, your colleagues and peers are also stuck, so for those who made it, uh, I welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome Charles Jenks uh, back to AA. Uh, he's our a regular guest in critics. Uh, he often joins reviews and also here uh, as a, a guest speaker in the last, what, 2008 uh, Critical Modernism that he gave a uh, lecture here. Uh, Charles Jenks is a uh, writer, architectural theorist, uh, and also a practice, uh, practicing landscape architect. Uh, he has completed a number of landscape projects around Europe, uh, particularly up in Scotland. Uh, uh, Mr. Jenks is also, uh, uh, oh, he's an author of a number of books, uh, most notably A Language of Postmodern Architecture, uh, which was published first in 1977, and I don't know if I can say interesting, but it has reissued many times, and the latest one is in the seventh edition, and if you go to place like Amazon to try to purchase. There's a whole series of numbers, Jenks number one, two, three, four, five. So there's all different versions of it. And interesting about this book is that it came 1997, but he has been updated uh, according to the change in uh, a discourse in architecture. In the latest one that came out uh, is a new title. Uh, it's called The uh, New Paradigm in Architecture. Uh, Uh, and he's been working on this primarily in the issue of uh, not necessarily against modernism, but uh, he's been promoting this idea of pluralism and multiplicity uh, and how that played out uh, within postmodern architecture. And he's one of a few, the very early theorists to promote the issue of complexity in architecture and also ecology, sustainability back in 1980s and also uh, actively in towards in the beginning of 1990s. Uh, he's also co-founder of uh, a Maggie Centers, uh, which would be our main talk uh, tonight. Uh, uh, this was established with his late wife. Uh, uh, and the center is for a patient, cancer patient, who have a place to go uh, in a hospital environment where Often the places are quite sanitized and very difficult to gain certain feelings and momentum for gaining their spirit. So uh, him and his uh, late wife uh, established this uh, Maggie Centers, which is now six around the world already being built, and there are quite a few are still coming ahead and being planned. Uh, so he'll be talking primarily on this new project about the Maggie Center. Uh, there is a uh, event uh, which will uh, be hosted uh, 29th of April. Uh, what time? The whole day? Two to six. Two to six uh, at the Charing Cross Hospital, uh, which is in Hammersmith. Uh, a number of uh, architects as well as uh, medical and hospital professions. Uh, they'll be talking about the issue in relation to the spaces, architecture, in uh, a future of medical profession and institutions. Uh, please join me welcoming Charles Jenks. Thank you. Um, can you hear me all right with this microphone? Yeah, good. Well, I'm going to speak tonight <coughs> on the architecture of hope. And I'm going to mention this hope, like faith and charity, um, are categories of thought. The question I'm posing using Maggie Centers as a background is whether there is an architecture of hope, and if there is such an architecture, what it would be. In the West, of course, there would be one in the East. It's quite different. But the supposition partly is that such a category exists, category of being, and its relationship to architecture is important and in a sense, essential. And I only have discovered that recently, 
with, along with archaeologists who've looked at places like Stonehenge, which you may know about seven or eight years ago, they started calling a regional hospital because as they dug up different graves, indeed the most important grave that they've discovered, uh, and they found a warrior and his son, and they looked at his legs and his knees, and they did the forensic crime analysis of what was uh, going on in his burial. Um, he was called a warrior because he was buried with bows and arrows and other instruments of the Bronze Age fighting class. They found out that he was there really uh, because he had a very sore heel and a bad knee, and he'd limped all the way from Switzerland with his son, who was also suffering from something else. Well, you know, one, what is it, doesn't make a spring, sparrow, uh, one, um, what is it? Swallow. Um, nor does one uh, warrior make a hospital. However, if you look in more depth, and archaeologists have done this with the blue stones at Stonehenge, the inner stones, they know that they were dragged uh, four or five hundred miles from the Presley Hills in Wales across water. Very difficult. They tried to do that today with barges, and the, all the stones sunk. So it's very difficult to bring these blue stones all the way. Why did they do it? The supposition they must have had some kind of meaning to the people who built Stonehenge in 2500 BC. And indeed, as they did further investigations, they see that Stonehenge, the supposition for many reasons, is a healing center, among other things. So, and this is one of the ideas behind an architecture of hope, is that Healing is much more important. Medicine, the gods of medicine and healing are much more important to architecture than I was taught. And I'm partly suggesting by today's talk and the Maggie Centers that we should look again at hospitals, healing, medicine, its relation to uh, the spirit, for those of you who are atheists, or religion, for those of you who believe in religion, and the whole relationship to other architectures. I think um, health, medicine, and healing are really essential, very important to these sites. And I, instead of showing you Stonehenge, I show you one castle rig in the Lake District of England where you can see uh, a stone circle focusing on a cleft in the hills. And uh, that stands for countless sites uh, in ancient history. And this tradition of healing and architecture, which I'm postulating as a continuous one in the West, I feel has been broken by modernism and by the notion of health uh, as a factory. In other words, modernist curing, which has divorced uh, itself from this greater tradition. So I show you now a, a view of the Asclepion, the area um, in Epidaurus, which was the number one healing site in Greece, uh, going even much further back than what these monuments, uh, the remains of these monuments on the site are, which is fourth, basically fourth and third century. In the hills, in the background, way up here you can see in these mist and shrouded hills, uh, the Mycenaeans established around 1600 a site to Apollo and Ascle his son, Asclepius, who was the god of healing, the major god of healing. So um, he was in the site for 1200 years before these, the biggest um, hospital in the Western world, the most renowned hospital, a huge um, set of buildings, was built 1200 years later. So there's an amazing continuity. and so. If you think of Stonehenge as 2500 BC to roughly 1500, I mean the major period of Stonehenge, it overlaps um, with the Asclepion and the Mycenaean. Um, and there's a way in which, of course, Stonehenge 
<coughs> if you think of it in larger picture of Britain BC, you realize that Britain was connected to uh, Europe and Stonehenge is on the major <laughs> east-west axis. And so it's not surprising that that warrior and others uh, uh, whose evidence we have came to Stonehenge to be healed. So these are very, very big thing, themes which have, if, this, if what I'm saying is true, a 4,000 plus uh, year history of connecting architecture uh, to hope and to healing, the architecture of hope is, I think, a category. What you're looking at here is just a um, reconstruction of, of a very small part of the Odeon built by the Romans. And so for seven or 800 years, this, uh, this center of healing existed. The Romans took it over. It was the most popular site for the Romans. And it had lots of water flowing through it. Purification was essential to it, and uh, people with various injuries in war and sicknesses or age problems came uh, to this. There was this hotel in back here for about you know, four, three or 400 people, separating the men from the women. And mostly the hotel was full of the carers or the friends or the family of the people who came here. And there was a Greek um, place to uh, bathing house in back there. And then various other huge buildings uh, which you're looking at. And behind where this photograph uh, it was taken, the major site uh, and temples. Um, the god Asclepius, his um, high period was, as I mentioned, from about 400 AD to 497 AD, the cult of Asclepius, uh, when uh, the Christians importantly, uh, the emperor, uh, I think it was Theodosius, uh, came to the site, or had his minions come here, and destroyed all of the architecture. And the architecture was, in a way, second to the uh, Acropolis, the Parthenon, in many respects. In fact, one of the buildings, the best building, the theater, which is the still the most famous theater in the world, uh, was uh, designed by Polycletus the Younger. And if you know the history of architecture, and you know Polycletus the Elder, you realize we're dealing here with the most important architects of the time. Anyway, Asclepius and his wife, who was also involved in healing, are seen in an archetypal act of laying on of hands while the person who is sick or suffering or injured is lying on what looks like an uncomfortable bed of stone and about to have a dream while his carers or friends or family are here um, uh, who have come along with him. So the carers, uh, the patient, the healing are connected. And obviously, Asclepius is a god incarnate in a sense. Uh, they he apparently, like Jesus, was a historical figure, um, was turned into the Asclepian religion, was turned into a very successful religion, as I say, about 600 BC. And by 400 to 300 BC, they, they built uh, these incredible temples. So we're really talking here about a practice, but a religious practice. So already, things have changed from its origins back with the Mycenaeans and obviously before that. And I bring this up because if we think of it in contemporary terms, we look at the word placebo, the placebo effect, and we think of how the placebo works. Up until 1953, the placebo was attacked by modernists as a phony cure um, and something to be, um, you know, by all means, expunged from contemporary science and medicine. But after the middle 50s, after it was shown that the placebo effect, while a phony cure, actually worked in something like 33% of the cases in medicine. So, as we know, and this is a book of 2002 on the placebo effect, the belief effect, in psychogenic uh, problems and diseases, you can say roughly one third of the patients who come in with uh, showing certain problems can be helped at least by what they believe. Uh, and a religious belief, of course, is part of that, or a psychic belief. 
or a belief in the doctors. It's very important to know that if the doctors themselves don't believe in the pill, then the placebo effect doesn't work. And indeed, <laughs> it's a fascinating thing. The color of the pill matters. And in different countries, if it's a red pill in Italy, it works. If it's a blue pill in Germany, it works. But the other colors don't work. So it's these beliefs. The first, first most important thing is get the doctor to believe in the, in the pill. And then if the doctor really believes it and administers it in the right way, and the patient really, really believes it, then psychogenic cures are real. And so today, even modernist doctors accept that the placebo effect works in certain cases. Of course, it doesn't work in the majority of cases. And it certainly doesn't work in ca cases like cancer, which have a physical cause. Or it may, in a small part of those cases, to do uh, with uh, certain kinds of uh, effects on the immune system. This is, of course, a, an interest, very interesting but contentious question. In any case, you can imagine what happens if you've got this great tradition uh, of belief working. <coughs> um, and when Asclepius put his hands on you, went to sleep, you had a dream, uh, you would, uh, the next day, you would uh, tell the priest. And the priest would interpret the dream, rather like Freud, and <coughs> prescribe certain kinds of medicines and cures, a lot of which had to do with running around the gymnasium, by the way. <laughs> so exercise was an important thing. And, and there's a very big gymnasium in this hot uh, hotel hospital, um, as well as a track field. I'll show you in a second. So there was a lot of you know today's uh, medicine of you've got to eat well and exercise and vegetables and fruit and all of that. Um, but slowly, over the years, um, Asclepius himself was noteworthy because he was a great surgeon. And you can find, if you go to Epidaurus, and even the bigger um, set of um, the Asclepian on the uh, Acropolis, just right next to the, just below the Parthenon, you find an, a vast array of surgical instruments. Here's just a small selection of them. So the success of this turned uh, what is mostly, if you like, kind of placebo effect into real science. And um, the evolution of these scientific instruments uh, by the year 300 BC uh, was extraordinary. And in the history of medicine, it remains. Uh, this was the high point of Western medicine until really many years later. So you could say there was a primary scientific um, medicine as well as a psychological medicine. And they always grew together. That's the track uh, which has been excavated. And you can even see the starting uh, elements there. You can see how it's importantly focused on a, on a part of the landscape. And the connection to nature is very important uh, throughout um, this tradition. Uh, so you can see worship of the body. Here you can see um, real racing. Um, and obviously, if you had, if you had say, a bad leg, and you came, you would bring a little memento of your leg, and you would put it on a votive offering. And then uh, you, would have, you would have the dream. The priest would rub your leg, and you'd go out on the starting field. Of course, you might not run very fast, but you'd hope, the architecture of hope. Asclepius himself uh, had, um, you would as you were in uh, having this cure, of course, you, you purify yourself here and you lie on the bed. And snakes would, uh, would, would be on the floor. And these snakes uh, symbol, they were, they were non-venomous snakes, I think, um, would be writhing around there, very uh, small, thin, white snakes. And they say in the Asclepion, here's Asclepius with his, uh, with his mitre or his sign of power. But on it was a, uh, a curling snake. And in here, there were uh, snakes writhing. So obviously, the connection of the snake is a symbol, the snake which sheds its skin. Later, the Christians took that over as a sign of resurrection. 
uh, was considered a magical act of nature. And it was, in a way, putting the patient in the situation next to nature and in nature, using nature to um, suggest things to the patient. Just a, a view of what of, of the excavated site. Um, and there's that racetrack. Uh, this is the major center. The first view you saw looking here, here's the hotel with the men and women. And uh, many, many different buildings, but the important abaton where you where you'd have the cure next you you'd sacrifice here you'd go in the water came in down here you'd purify yourself you'd go in there have the dream the next morning you come out here talk to a priest and you might go into a solace tomb there or the temple of Asclepius the temple you saw and this is the solos uh, designed by Polycletus. So you can get an idea from these French reconstructions in color uh, the, of the importance of this architecture. And by the way, in the bottom there, they thought it, perhaps it's a maze as a snake pit. So <laughs> you'd have to go into the maze if you were particularly daring and, s and, and see if you could get your way through it uh, uh, and not be frightened by the snakes. So kind of cure by catharsis. Anyway, up on the hill, uh, Polycletus the Younger constructed this extraordinary theater, which is, has to be the greatest theater ever made in a sense, in, a, in two senses. One, in, in acoustically, it is still the best, so that wherever you stand down here, your voice can be heard all around it. This is the Greek part, this is the Roman part. Uh, in the sense that the acoustics are incredible, also, of course, like these Greek theaters, the Sina opens out on raw nature, on wilderness, still today. I mean, it's extraordinary the relationship between the architecture and nature. This is the kind of opposition which, uh, you know, is so rare to find in a hospital today, <laughs> or in a city, or anywhere. So, this is a standard. Now, I want to shift gears and look at uh, Maggie's centers, these cancer caring centers that Maggie and I established uh, for cancer sufferers next to a hospital. The idea was uh, to build one, which we did in Edinburgh in 1995, 96. She died in 1995, but she had the idea of converting a stable next to the Western General hospital outside of Edinburgh, a great big modernist hospital, a hospital factory, a, a hospital of 5,000 or 7,000 people, people coming in during the day and leaving. Quite a nice hospital, a very effective hospital, and some of the great um, surgeons and um, uh, surgical equipment. So it's the Maggie Center's relationship to a, a factory hospital is not a counter but an addition. It's a, uh, a juxtaposition. It's something that's near the hospital but not in the hospital for reasons which I could go into later. Anyway, there she is in a garden which she helped design in Vancouver for Joe Wei, the architect, and it's the Vancouver Chinese Garden. Uh, and you see it's a Chinese garden. It's a very strange garden. There's almost nothing growing in it. Um, it's a peanut brittle um, stones those wonderful stones that the Chinese uh, collect. They construct a garden. They don't grow it in China. And uh, you can see how architectural it is. They, they say a Chinese garden is to do with um, water and rocks, yin and yang, masculine and feminine. Um, when she had cancer, th we were very interested, particularly I was interested in all of the work being done in science, which was being announced uh, weekly in the scientific journals or almost weekly in the daily press. And so I collected it and we looked at it and it inspired her and inspired me particularly. And it's the counterpart to the architecture of hope, which is hope, of course, of anyone with uh, kind of cancer that is uh, life-threatening in which you've given it death threatens 
you are, at least a certain percentage, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the people, are hoping that there will be some scientific breakthrough and it will occur when they're, uh, as when they're still alive. So the architecture of hope then has its analog in the, um, in the science of hope. And that science of hope is a very interesting one if you think of it because it's um, a worldwide movement in genetics among other, uh, in o in other areas to um, deal uh, with what is basically a mistake in the genome. Cancer is a genetic uh, disease. It's a typing error, in one in 15,000 letters. Uh, one, can, one typing mistake can, can, won't necessarily cause cancer. I mean, it is, a, it is a kind of a truism that everybody in the world has cancer all the time, but the immune system recognizes it and changes the typing mistakes. So, the year before she died, uh, she was doing all of those things uh, that you were told to do in Epidaurus, like eat well, exercise, and so on, that she said it was the best year of her life. Um, an interesting uh, statement. But for me, as important uh, as uh, the fight with cancer, and of course this word fight with cancer is a metaphor, like hope is a metaphor. In 1971, uh, Nixon, the President of the United States, declared the war on cancer. And if you think of war on cancer, you think that's a metaphor to fight, to have war, as if <coughs> cancer is some kind of enemy out there that you could bomb, uh, like as it, like the war on terror, kind of a misnomer in a way. And it's a metaphor for misnomer. So importantly, and this is where you, you have to think about metaphor, the metaphor of hope, and the metaphor of war, and the metaphor of architecture, and what is a metaphor and how important are metaphors in this battle. What, what does architecture represent in that battle? I say that because um, Susan Sontag got cancer and she wrote a terrific attack on bad metaphor. And she wrote, her book is called Illness is Metaphor. And she said, what happens when you get cancer is you think you're to blame. And you're not to blame. Cancer is not a judgment on your character. Cancer is a physical disease. And she showed how people metaphorize their diseases and, and society does that. And so you begin to see that the architectural metaphor and the metaphor of the illness uh, are important. And you can see how with Nixon's war on cancer, that if you take the war on cancer and you look at the statistics, of course, cancer is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. It's a curve basically like this. And there's, a more, there's another interesting curve too, which is that the cancer remissions and cure curves is growing like that. So the war on cancer, we're slightly losing because many more people are getting cancer. But actually, we're winning the war. And is it a war? <laughs> if you all have cancer all the time, and you think that everybody's going to live to 120, is what the scientists are you know, saying, at least the most optimistic ones, then it's clear that if you live to 120, as the saying goes, you'll certainly die of cancer because cancer is a disease of aging. It's a disease of the genome. It's a disease when the telomeres get shorter. So. I show you all of this because uh, it's a background to this what I call the pile of hope, which is a pile of all the cuttings from the press over four or five years, which gets rather large. If you take you know, one a week, for 52 weeks, you get piles and piles of hope. And <laughs> this gets interesting because you begin to see that it's not your problem. Uh, it's really the human problem. It's an inevitable problem. It's an inevitable problem of success, of, civi of cities, of, uh, of our uh, lifestyle, of our, you know, of our growth, of modernism. So cheer up. We've all got cancer. Um, something to look forward to. It'll be a mark for your having made it. Um, Maybe that's another metaphor rather than a war or fighting. But I, 
I want to put out the idea that as an architect, uh, and this is what I will be showing later, that wrestling with these metaphors is important. Now, when Maggie read uh, many of those journalists, she, she got uptight. She said, that's too much information. I hate all this information. I can't stand it. Uh, you can read it. Uh, but I gave her one article, which was by <laughs> Stephen Jay Gould, uh, a man who was given only uh, two months to live, as she was, and who died in 2002, uh, 35 years after he was supposed to be dead. And he, a Harvard professor, you know, a major, the major writer on biology, wrote a, a very a brilliant uh, writer, wrote a wonderful thing called the, the Median is Not the Message, nor is the Mean the Message. And he produced uh, long tail diagrams. And you probably know that the normal curve, uh, the bell curve, with its median and its uh, mean, what he said is the median is not the message, pun on McLuhan. And he, what he said, you, you, I, he said, what I had to do was, OK, I was going to die in two or three months. But if I could put myself in the right-hand part of the curve, the long tail, put myself way out there, I'd have a better uh, hope. I'd have a better chance. And he studied it up, and then he figured out that he was in the long tail. Maggie read that, and that really changed her view. And she decided from that moment on to fight. And she lived for two years, uh, and her death sentence was you know, three months. So hope leads to knowledge. Knowledge uh, leads to, uh, in, in her case, uh, getting high-dose chemotherapy and lots of primary as well as secondary um, therapies. And it led to the notion of these cancer caring centers, which she called cancer ca caring centers, which I called Maggie after her name because they were self-help centers based on patients helping themselves. That's why you see she designed a bird, and I changed it to CCC, this self-similar bird, which is rather optimistically uh, cheering at the top. And the first one was in this. Um, this uh, used stable, this, uh, an old uh, 18th or 19th century building near but not in the hospital. And you can see uh, how Richard Murphy, the architect, has used his uh, modernist vocabulary there and threaded it through uh, a classical stable. What you're looking at is the dining table. And there, the interior with these uh, different bright colors. You see focus. The dining table, uh, the most important center of the Maggie Center, is a place where patients can come in the door and make a cup of coffee immediately without, at the, at the table there, uh, without necessarily having to take part in the center itself. They can insinuate themselves into uh, the center without having to declare themselves. So they can come in step by step. In any case, a Maggie Center is, in a way, a small house, a domestic building. And uh, that friendliness, that uh, hominess, that cheerfulness are all part of the meanings that she very much cared about and wanted to give the center. She had died when this first one by Richard Murphy uh, had been built. Uh, it was successful enough so that we had to expand it and add on another, uh, the entrance is here, which you saw looking that way. There's the kitchen table. Uh, that's where you make a cup of coffee. We've added this bit uh, for group meetings. And the kitchen is very important, as I mentioned. <coughs> it's so much so that our philosophy has been ca called a kind of kitchen-ism, um, to welcome people in and be the center of any magazine, rather than an institution. So as we began to grow and we established other centers, we understood the philosophy uh, which we'd partly thought about and partly not thought about, which is that the informality uh, uh, makes it something like an institution at a hospital, but it's a non-institution institution, if you see what I mean. In other words, we train carers. They're professionals, but they, you don't have to fill out any forms as you do in the usual situation. 
well, this is a bit of obvious points about what I've been saying, that basically the statistics show that in the future one in two people will get cancer. Um, so it will become a major, along with heart disease, it will become you know, the, the leading problem of our time. It already is. One in three now get cancer. Which means one in two families have it. And it's a basically, it's a social as well as a physical disease. It's one where you know, your friends and, and relatives are involved in caring. Our second center was in Glasgow at a, also a conversion of an old building, a 19th century gatehouse to Glasgow University. Again, right next to, on the left here, you don't see it, but where this photograph is taken from, a huge factory hospital, a modernist hospital. And I must mention in passing that, of course, it's very important to have that modernist hospital. And if one goes into a hospital, one enjoys its impersonality, its efficiency, and all the aspects of primary curative uh, medicine, which uh, modernism uh, was about. In other words, it treats the patient partly as an object uh, with a problem to be fixed, like a machine. And in a way, one respects that, and that's perfectly fine. For cancer, however, which is partly a social and psychological and cultural problem, because when you have cancer, you often live for two or three years or 10 years, or you might have remission. And you can't treat it just as a physical problem. Whatever you do to try it, well, some people can. But that rare is the case. You have to, often you have to, for instance, have an economic problem. You have to get a loan. And Maggie Centers has a section which tells you where to get a loan and helps you in those uh, kinds of cases. It, it's, as I've hinted, it's important because of the self-help nature of the way patients help each other. I think one of the most important things that goes on in these centers is these groups meetings uh, where over lunch, over coffee, uh, both formally and informally, they share experiences and tell each other uh, things of where to get a wig if their hair falls out because of chemotherapy uh, and uh, other very important uh, social and economic uh, aspects that, are, that hit you with cancer. Again, uh, the building um, come in the, the door, the front door, and you're f confronted by the kitchen for coffee and tea. The kitchen is in, there's the table around which meetings occur, another uh, open plan meeting area. And you walk up the stairs, and the building, as three or four other Maggie centers, is, is a kind of spiral of space, of semi-private space. As I mentioned, rather like a home, if you want to think of it, it's, it's like Queen Anne Revival House in, in London, uh, with uh, ingle nooks in areas which uh, are which are public, communal areas near the front door, but which is uh, closable in part. So uh, again, like a Queen Anne Revival House, say a Norman Shaw building, if you, or a Frank Lloyd Wright, early Frank Lloyd Wright building. If you want to think of, it, of the kind of spaces it has, it has to be very private for one-on-one -on -one therapy, uh, and it has to be changeable and, and semi-public for talks and very public for meetings. So it's a spiral of space uh, towards more and more privacy at the top. And at the top, in this case, in Glasgow, it's actually where the fundraisers work. And it's very important, that aspect, because it's in a way, Maggie Centers are an institution where we have to raise the two million pounds or three million pounds for each center. And it's important that those fundraisers are part of the larger uh, institution. Looking down at a garden that I was asked to uh, design, an early stage of it, and I designed this um, DNA, which spirals out of a little mound here. And it spirals out up with its uh, unfolding RNA. And it comes down, and it prints out A, T, C, G, the, f the letters of, of DNA, uh, which you can sit on. If you walk up here, two people or three people can sit here. Um, not for very long because it's a hard seat. And it also prints out who donated the money 
or at least who donated a lot of the money, which was the Evening Standard, which ran a uh, competition and a series of walks, uh, which raised a half a million pounds. So uh, the symbolism then of the DNA and the symbolism of uh, the fundraising is incorporated in this uh, kind of architectural uh, element. And you can see coming out of it in the planting of the um, different kind of sedum and berberis and these purple rocks, you can see the, the unfolding of the RNA into protein. That's you could see if I, if I got you close to it. You can't see it, but you'll have to imagine. So there's a way in which then the architecture and the garden and the space relate to each other. I define then uh, Maggie Centers as a hybrid building which, in which it's a hospital and institution, which is a non-institution. It's a church, which is not religious, because people come in there asking existential questions. It's, it's got art in it, but it's not a museum. And it's a house, which is not a home. So it's four different building types put together, which <coughs> relate to other types, and that's one of the metaphors I would like to suggest that this architecture of hope is about. In other words, it's a radical hybrid nature. In 1981 or so, Maggie and I visited the Hotel de Bonne uh, because of uh, the Hospice de Bonne, which is one of the great French Burgundian wines. Uh, Burgundy, of course, has is is, is got the greatest wines in the world but there's very little of it to drink. But Hospice de Bone, the Hospital of Bone, is one of the best. And um, we were, I was interested in going there and getting some wine. So uh, also, by the way, it has some terrific uh, medieval churches. So we're driving there for architecture and drink. And I knew about this uh, building through architectural history, which is the greatest roof of the Burgundian age, 1460 uh, hospital donated by a man named Rohan, Nicholas Rohan, gave this hospital to the poor. And he, it's a hospital uh, like the one in Epidaurus with a hotel attached, but a, a very big hospital area and a refectory and other offices and so on. And then a church on one side of a garden with a fountain. So it, it's a kind of hybrid itself. And what's so extraordinary about it, what Maggie and I found when we visited it, we had no idea really about its hospice qualities, was that the church uh, had, <coughs> that, which you came in first, you walked in on the nave and in the aisles, it had a series of beds in red, Burgundian velvet, right in the aisles, all tilted towards the high altar. It looked like kind of heaven for sex and good Burgundian wine. And the most surreal a mixture of meanings, if you're thinking about uh, you know, how bizarre it was to find beds, oh, <laughs> everybody lying there. Of course, they weren't lying there when we went in because it, it wasn't being used that way. But it, I mean, it really uh, opened our eyes to a different view of the hospital, of the mass hospital. Imagine going to an NHS hospital and finding, first of all, red burgundy. And then, you know, uh, religion and everything mixed up in health. That, that was interesting because we now, we. You know, we have so many diseases in hospitals that we have to decontaminate people who are visiting. You have to be deloused before you get in the door. And these hospitals, of course, probably were German. But it was this radical nature of the hybrid. And we went next into another room, and we found um, that it was a museum. And in the museum was one of the great Roger van der Weyden paintings which is an amazing painting with, you know, red-blooded Burgundian Christ in passion, blood, 
all over him symbolically. And not like the art you see in all the NHS hospitals, which are which is anodyne, have a nice day art, with, you know, abstract, killing you with kindness. This art, you know, had the the saved and the damned, and it was in a kind of apotropaic art that the Greeks would have understood. That is just cathartic. It showed people with crutches, bleeding, suffering, painful, honoring their death. All right, it was in, within a Christian context. And we have to remember the Christians did destroy Epidaurus and just pulverize it. But they did partly because they knew how important health and architecture and culture and religion were. Anyway, this, so th this is a model for the hybrid. And uh, coming back to Maggie's centers, I, uh, it's becoming a model for us as we go forward to see that to involve other professions, artists as well as architects. The next design was for Inverness, and I worked on it with Page and Park, the Scottish architects. It's again next to factory, hospital, huge. The 30 of these in Britain, we hope to have a Maggie Center at every one. Uh, we, we had a dinky little building here in the open area, and Page, uh, David Page didn't know quite what to design, and I was working on uh, the idea of cells being talking to each other. And so he thought that's a good idea, and he turned the cell upside down, the mound upside down, and it became the story of the cell undergoing mitosis, which is cell division. One cell, two cells, two cells talking to each other, three cells. A garden then where the balance between the cells, which we know is what a healthy cell does, the biology of it, it became the program, the iconography for the building. And that explains it. I won't go into science, but the paracrine uh, messages go through the short uh, flashes and the endocrine uh, the messages go through the long flashes. And these two cells, their nucleus, is send out these messages. And in healthy cells, they're always, all the time, chattering. Basically, it's the messages, the meanings between the cells which keeps them in balance. And cells which have cancer are programmed to commit suicide. And what happens with a cancerous cell is it throws away the gun and it starts multiplying like that. Cancer is the runaway mass production of a cell where these words aren't being exchanged. Because every cell in your body, all six trillion of them, is programmed with a gun to its head. And if it's got cancer, it's told, shoot itself. That's, what, that's why you're, <laughs> you're so healthy. So that became the design for the uh, landscape with these communicational things through the flashes there. Through the, and this is the upside down mound, the green building there. It's dividing a single one over there. Another spiral building in space. And there's a way in which this, the nucleus of the cell and the other cells communicate. Here's a spiral of space. There's a meeting going on in the communal space. The spiral of space comes, uh, you come in the door, the kitchen is there, you go up the stairs and it spirals up to the office. Zaha Hadid, a uh, student of mine in the AA, uh, in 1977 designed this building. Uh, sorry, designed the next she didn't design this building. She, she's looking like this building. That's why I took this picture of her. Um, in her, you, know, you may know her designs are anamorphic. She's, this is 1540 uh, anamorphic building, which is distorted and squeezed like Zaha. This is the one she did for Maggie's um, in Scotland outside. Uh, a hospital very next uh, in uh, Kikaldi in Fife, um, right by the hospital, right in the parking lot, interestingly. Uh, she designed a white building at this stage, uh, then to be made out of Corten steel. But if you think of it as a Zaha building, of course, it has that very simple landform quality to it, in a sense as all uh, buildings of Zaha uh, uh, approach the condition 
of a piece of land art. And this one was no different from that, uh, with very jagged edges. Um, and because it couldn't be built out of Corte and Steel, it was too expensive. And because it was in a car park, we had to build it out of much cheaper, kind of very beautiful asphalt. And now it's no longer white, but it's black. And it's another spiral of space. Do a degree come in there, go through the front door, and it opens out over a beautiful space you'll see. And the kitchenism is there. Uh, another public space there. That's where exercises go on. Consulting rooms there, loo there. Um, and you can see in this comparison how the metaphor <coughs> isn't only of folding and of uh, Darth Vader and uh, a kind of um, one of those stealth aircraft, but uh, is a crystalline metaphor. And I'm arguing not only is it the architecture of hope to do with a hybrid, a functional hybrid, but um, I'm beginning to argue that it is also a mixed metaphor as well as a simple metaphor. In other words, uh, as we begin to understand more about cancer as a disease, you'll see uh, that cancer, the 250 kinds of cancer, and they have all the different stages, and therefore you can't deal with them with one metaphor, one, uh, one cure. Here it is looking down from the Dell, uh, this, this amazing piece of greenery right in this heart, a huge mass-produced environment. And its jewel heart was created, um, this is George Brown country, was created by miners in the 19th century digging out coal. So this is a coal pit. And this is nature has turned it green. Interesting. So luckily, and Zaha went to that site. I mean, she chose that site. And her building relates to it. That's a view looking into it. You can see how our details of the triangle pick up in a small way the, those, uh, those prismatic forms of the quartz and the metaphor of a mineral, and the mineral relates to nature and looks out over nature. She performs, in other words, as, this, uh, as people walk down that corridor from the parking lot of the black parking lot into the white geode of mineral, then they look out in nature and they start uh, you know, having discussions and exercising Tai Chi and all that stuff. They are going into another space. And I think that's important for the transformation which happens in 90s. Our center recently completed uh, by Richard Rogers here in London where the conference is on the 29th, the Charing Cross Hospital, is in a very dense part of the, of the city with high speed road here with buses, red buses going down, and a secondary road here. And the hospital, this giant hospital which I've photoshopped out so it looks like a pure London sky free from airplanes. Um, surrounded by Dan Pearson's uh, white birch, actually, they're now red birch. Uh, so a kind of conceptually a, an orange uh, pavilion in a forest. One of the things we gave uh, Richard Roger and his team, Stirk and Harbor, uh, was Maggie's book on Chinese gardens. And this is, in a sense, a Chinese pavilion, uh, orange, remember the orange-red pavilions, the Chinese, in a garden. Uh, I mean, conceptually, he looked at that very much in the small spaces you'll see are based in the Chinese garden set of spaces described by Maggie as space cells, small space cells, which open into small little nooks. And you can see you enter a spiral of space through a walk of Dan Pearson's into a nice garden area. It's now grown a lot more than that. And it's a kind of decompression area. You go into another uh, part of the spiral with a very high wall, about 16 feet high. And you look at the, through <laughs> this wonderful window, which is, you can see the buses go by, but you don't hear them because it's, you can see them. It's translucent. Um, the light comes from, the shadow comes from. Beautiful relationship to then uh, all of the noise and industrialization of our of reality, but that framed out by the walls. 
So a defensive architecture, an inward-looking architecture, an Pompeian architecture, uh, which deals with its urban site. Here's another view of that, with focusing on again the kitchen. You were looking through that the hole there. Here's the kitchen table. You enter in that spiral of space, and you can see if you study the plan, it's one of the most interesting of all Richard Rogers' plans. It's rather like those structuralist plans of Alder Van Eyck in the 60s. Uh, it has a, it has a, a beautiful way space is fragmented, and you can always look from one space to another. So its metaphor is not only the kitchenism, the kitchen table, where the center, the heart of Maggie's, where things happen, where those, those uh, patients discuss things either inside or outside with each other. That's where a lot of the therapy goes on, and people stay in these centers all day, some of them. They are real respites from the factory. Factory is necessary, but so is the other space. Um, and you can see into different parts. You can see across spaces. You can see in the little gardens. There are about three little gardens. In a way, it has the airport lounge feeling, in the sense it's, <laughs> it's not unlike Terminal 5. But it's a very friendly one. And <coughs> you can insinuate yourself into different groups. And so a lot goes on here. We have art groups. We have a full panoply of activities that go on throughout the week. It divides them up into small, medium, and large. It's, it's, you know, it is in the way that Alder Van Eyck's work. It's a beautiful way of dividing society up into smaller groups. Now, I'll just end quickly with looking at um, some other Maggie centers under construction. This is one in, in the Cotswolds by Richard McCormick. I just show you his plan, really, to get give you the idea of how it's designed from the inside out and how related it is to Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, early work, in a sense. Uh, and Richard did some beautiful early studies when he was a student at Cambridge on Frank Lloyd Wright. So it takes a, no, a 19th century building here when he joins it. And it plays the game I've been talking about, uh, breaking up and uniting uh, with a garden around it, plays that opposition between nature and culture, which is important for uh, Maggie Centers and I think for architecture and health generally. There's the garden by Christine Facer, a uh, path by, uh, with um, um, a real uh, design by um, the, the water artist. Then we have a, um, a few Maggie Centers which are in effect tree houses. This one uh, by Wilkinson and Eyre in Oxford, again next to a very large hospital, but just in the midst of a grove of trees which have been donated by the man who owns the trees around it. And uh, Wilkinson and Eyre have designed this wooden uh, building that you walk into across a gangway. And you can't really see the surface in the treatment of it, but it takes the leaf form and it takes the wood form and the triangular form and it miniaturizes it at different scales. So it becomes a kind of fractal um, uh, tree house. Or Kisho Kurokawa, a very close friend of mine from Japan, who I've known, who I knew for 45 years, designed before he died a year ago this uh, a kind of spiral uh, building in the shape of a galaxy. We talked about it together, and he, in a very Japanese way, mixed it with uh, the kind of Japanese garden design of uh, water and um, the things you see in a way relate to the Chinese garden. So that building, a, a galactic, cosmic image, is put again next to a very large building. And there is an image of it. Um, Kurokawa's uh, last kind of concrete style combined with, you, you could say, an almost um, Edo-like pitched roof style. Uh, in this case, the spiral going right into the earth and becoming part of the earth and the water. 
more recently, that design has changed, um, and the landscape has been taken over by Kim Wilkie, who um, is doing, I think, perhaps a landform in back, but in front uh, with a roundabout a, where cars will come in and drop people off. He's doing a kitchen uh, vegetable garden. So um, some of the patients uh, who are interested will be growing their own vegetables. And Piers Goff, another student here in the AA in the 60s and 70s, is doing one of the uh, tree houses. Uh, I shouldn't call them one of them, but there are at least two um, in Nottingham. And that will be under construction in uh, three or four months. And that's a view uh, looking down at the model. And you can see it, it is a kind of, if you know Piers Goff's work, uh, both a very a pop work and a very classical Palladian villa. So it's a kind of postmodern mixture of a Palladian grammar uh, with a, a pop element and color. So these are some of the centers under construction. And here is an analysis of the different types. And if you think of this as, if you think of Maggie centers then as a generic type, and you think of how it's developing <coughs> in the NHS uh, milieu, and then maybe overseas, there's a Hong Kong one, uh, which Frank Gehry's doing, you can see that as opposed to a lot of institutions which franchise themselves, there is no uh, repetition of an identical type. And of course, it would be a lot cheaper if, it, if we just reproduced one type endlessly. And that brings up the fact that in a lot of um, churches and in a lot of institutions, for instance, the Cistercians mass produced every single church that they built so that whenever you visited one, you knew exactly as you came in the front door where to go. These are different, and as you look at this, typological analysis, you can see um, the pinwheel plans, the spiral plans, the donut plans, and the linear plans. So each one is different. Each architect makes a different kind of move. And it's interesting how important that has become for us in all sorts of ways. And it's interesting to compare it uh, because some of these architects like Zaha and Gary and Coolhouse is building one are big named architects and have done a lot of iconic buildings. I show you one cover of a book I didn't publish um, called Icon The Iconic Building. If you read the subtitle, The Power of Paranoia. Um, and um, it, y it, the subtitle, uh, The Power uh, of the Enigma, it became. The Power of Paranoia, though, when this was the cover, um, had, of course, that building, which you can probably just make out as the gherkin uh, taking off. And one of the reasons this cover was uh, not accepted was that um, when the publishers tried it out on the reps, they thought they were selling books uh, destined for the military. But in any case, uh, my point for the icon, I, I, I mean, my point in bringing it up was that iconic buildings, of course, are a genre of our time, major genre. They're not going to go away uh, for many, many reasons. And uh, the successful ones are mixed metaphors. And that's what uh, I'm arguing for these Maggie centers. They're mixed metaphors. And this is important for cancer. So I would call Maggie centers uh, iconic, small iconic buildings. And little weeny iconic buildings. I mean, these are, you know, um, uh, how many? 250 square meters? You know, hardly a house, a small house. They can grow. I mean, sometimes we add to them. But they are iconic in a sense, and they are enigmatic in an obvious sense. And it's interesting how the architects have responded so positively. And I think partly they have because they're challenged by a program which is very tightly written iconographically without <coughs> specifying what the icons are. 
So, so far in something like 12 or 13 designs, and you can see them in the book, um, we haven't had a, a really bad uh, design for a Maggie Center book. Architects have outperformed themselves, as far as I'm concerned, as a client. And Frank Gehry's building is one of uh, our very good ones. I end with. It's the one in Dundee, um, which uh, when it was opened, uh, Bob Geldorf uh, said it looks like a, a portrait of Frank Gehry as a dumpling, as a fat little man. And I mention this because, you know, when he said that, the press, which came, was very electrified, both by Bob Geldorf and by the image of the building as Frank as a dumpling. Um, and it suggests that architecture has other, uh, you know, these architects have other uses than just designing buildings, i.e., they help us raise money, which is, of course, absolutely essential if you have to raise the two to three million pounds that they cost to, to fund and to build and then to, to run. You have to raise the running cost to. This is a plan that shows the generic qualities in a different way. You enter by the door there. The, the kitchen, kitchenism is there. The ingle nooks are in there. And there's one upstairs in that dumpling building, which is partly a lighthouse, partly a beacon as a metaphor. And you can see, you can go out and look. Uh, you can sit here, outdoor meals when the weather is good in Dundee, which it sometimes is. You can eat out there. So it's a building uh, which is, in a way, like all the others, but which articulates the metaphor in, in particular ways, having to do, in Frank's case, with the roof. It's, uh, the roof was expensive, and uh, he paid and we paid the money for the ceiling as well as the outdoor uh, fractal roof, which reflects uh, sunlight in a beautiful way. And you can say, what, does, what is it doing for you? What is all this extra architecture doing for you? Of course, people who paid for it, that is the people who raised the money from, were very upset by this. <laughs> so there are tensions within architecture. And it is true, you know, the cost of the building is probably 30 to 40 percent more than it would be for a very minimalist version of the same space. But the building very soon, in two or three years, pays for itself th in all sorts of ways. So this is really something to think about, the longevity of the building, how it's used, how the uh, patients and carers, most importantly the carers, curiously, respond to it. Because in a way, the building is successful because the carers are cared for and they know they're cared for and the building says that. The architecture really matters in that sense. And if the carers care, then they look after the patients. A picture of Frank with uh, talking to Piers Goff as the dumpling. And here is Frank. I took this picture of him besieged by about the world's press. You know. I mean, for this little dinky building, it became the biggest media event in 2000, well, 1999 and then 2002. It got more column inches than any other building. B really embarrassing, in a sense. Why? Well, it obviously the Bill Bow effect. Uh, Frank, why should Frank come to you know Little Dundee uh, to build a tiny building? And this uh, gave us a lot of support in terms of. Uh, you know, the press, and then in raising money. Up until that moment, 2001 really, we hadn't thought of architecture as an important social and economic spur. It's important to think about this because you could ask, why haven't other British institutions used architecture this way? Really key. Why in Britain is architecture the last thing anyone wants to spend money on? Which is true. I mean, it's really uh, you know, a question you have to ask. Anyway, we didn't realize that until this building, that the architecture would help the architect. And the media event would help to pay for the building. There's the kitchen. Recently, uh, I, maze has been added to, nature has been redesigned in 
the transition between the mass factory and the entranceway and this um, maze based on the one at Chartres uh, is right outside the front door and patients walk the maze. It takes them, I think, something like five minutes. It's a universal maze to get to the center and then another five minutes to get out. And so insofar as being a patient is a kind of journey, this is rather an appropriate metaphor of contemplation and of facing it with yourself or with a friend walking behind you. Uh, the, the designer Arabella Lennox Boyd has designed another rose uh, uh, in a uh, kind of enclosed uh, sensual perfumed garden in another space. And just to one side there's an Antony Gormley, so the art is part of it. Um, we're looking out over the River Tay, framed by the view, uh, the view framed by his roof. Asymmetrically, you can see how <laughs> he's uh, played the very symmetrical outdoor eating space with a asymmetrical pitched roof and framed it. And it seems to me, in a way, it recalls the Epidaurus theater. It's definitely a cosmic architecture, one which is set in absolute juxtaposition with nature, uh, in which you look out over the far distant view and you connect to it very directly to an unmediated way. Uh, and you can see when the art, the sighting of the Gormley, uh, in a kind of apotropaic way, uh, pushes you towards the River Tay and pushes you towards the horizon. And that a very strong feeling of, of a direct, uh, direct uh, connection to nature is underlines that old saying, when you've lost a loved one, take your grief to nature. Or if you have a pain, take it back to nature. In other words, nature and healing have been connected since the beginning. And that, in our architecture, frames that. And I think all the architects have responded partly with that message. So when you go up in that little um, beacon, or that dumpling, uh, the meditation room again frames it. And you can see just in the framing of that awning, cutting down the sunlight, that it's almost as if the River Tay and the hills and the mountains are a painting painted on the glass. So I think the architecture of hope then is a genre. <coughs> um, it's a, a genre which had a very long history. It has partly to do with a mixed metaphor um, and a mixed building type. And partly in our case, it is because the metaphor of the war on cancer, the fight of cancer, is of course a truthful one, but it isn't the only one. And if an architect is trying to interpret through his architecture, or architecture, and if the landscape is interpreted through metaphor, then cosmic metaphors, metaphors of nature, <coughs> and metaphors, multiple metaphors, are a language of hope, an architecture of hope. Thank you. see in the back, uh, it's for sale today, so uh, please go ahead and purchase if you would like to. Uh, just to, before we uh, open the question, I just want to ask uh, one or two. Uh, the one, uh, it's, it's, first of all, thank you so much, it's very, very inspiring a lecture. I'm just wondering when I was uh, listening, I wonder what uh, your former wife Maggie would think about uh, what you're doing right now, obviously she never really imagined her project to be expanded beyond her uh, mm. 
a little stable, perhaps, mm. that regional yeah. one that right. she thought of doing it. And I wonder, she had an idea of this kind of work could be expanded and, you know, uh, not institutionalized, but begin yeah. to yeah. Uh, subordinate that kind of machinic uh, yeah. kind of hospital environment around the world. Well, uh, if you ask me what she would have thought of it right now, I would tell you she was a student here, so she'd be very happy. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. She was a student of the age. Anyway, uh, she had in mind that it would be uh, perhaps a blueprint. She wrote a blueprint for a cancer caring center when she was uh, writing the original blueprint. And so she must have had in mind more than one, but she never discussed it with me. So it was never an explicit program. And in fact, we had, we raised the money, uh, part of the money while she was alive, um, but she died a year before it was built. So she had no idea that it would be uh, more than one. And I think she would have been uh, very uh, excited and very chuffed by the fact that a lot of her close friends uh, had been involved. Mm -hmm. In fact, out of the 10, 12 architects, I think 10 knew her. Uh, Wilkinson and Eyre didn't know her. But uh, a lot of these people have been their close friends and AA students, so right. you've asked me the right question about the AA. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any plans how many of the well, uh, Maggie you know, Center I, would I be think, expanded uh, ideally, around the world? W ideally speaking, we would like to have one at every major hospital, but we have to raise about three million per, ho per building, and uh, that's, especially in this climate, it's extremely hard. I think people recognize, I mean, they are, they are, I haven't talked about how they work. I haven't talked about why they've been successful. There are a lot of things I haven't mentioned. But I think, uh, you know, the National Health Service is really happy with them, uh, as long as they don't have to pay. Mm. And they really are complementary to the National Health Service and, and the factory. You know, and so in this conference we're having on the 29th, with, which is architecture and health, we're, we're sort of interested in how far this could be a model for the National Health Service and for health generally. You know, they say of the National Health Service that it's the largest bureaucracy outside the Red Army in China in the world. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's rather frightening. If you think of that many people employed and that big an organization, it's huge. What it needs is some, it, 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 you, this is my personal view, it, you know, it, it works, where it works very well, it works brilliantly, but it doesn't do everything right. And I think if you say what percentage of a hospital should mutate into something like the Maggie said, in other words, be a, a mixed building type, I would say in the future, 20 to 30 percent, because in the future, people will uh, live longer, there's no question. If they live longer, they'll spend much more time in a hospital. If they spend much more time in a hospital uh, for their parents or themselves, they'll want it to be a mixed building type. They'll want to eat there. They'll want to be like a hotel. They'll want it to be entertainment for their children if they have to visit. And I see, you know, that the hospital, it's going to be difficult. They'll have to pay more money to, for hospital. But I see, and this is happening in Japan, that hospitals are becoming, uh, in America, that they are evolving simply because society is spending so much time. If you spend 20 to 30% of your life in or around a hospital, then either we're going to be more miserable or hospitals are going to evolve. So I feel that the, the trends will be this way, and there are a lot of indications that, the, that it's happening. Mm -hmm. For instance, the hospital is city. And this is uh, Edward Heathcote, who wrote this book with me. Eddie Heathcote, um, his, his essay is really on this subject. And if you, one of the people who's coming to the conference, uh, Cora Wagner from Holland, and, and the Dutch are very much uh, interested in this. Uh, and their hospitals are small cities. <laughs> so there's the city thing. Now, but there are many trends. I know this isn't quite the question you asked me, but it, it does, it's really worth thinking about if you're thinking about what is the lesson of Maggie Center. No, it's, it's very interesting that uh, 
because you mentioned about Japan, uh, this whole issue of uh, sustainability, for instance, that we are quite uh, engaged at this point of, of, of the century. But now, if you talk to people in Japan about sustainability, it's not about how to sustain a society so that you know, we can maintain a certain lifestyle energy production and so forth. I mean, that's what we associate sustainability with in Japan. Sustainability all to do is how to maintain the elderly uh, generations. Mm -hmm. So the different ways the spaces need to be converted in order, not for the younger people, but for the older. So it's just kind of interesting that, uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned about the, the kind of uh, 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 those kind of spaces. Again. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one other question before I just wanted to open up. Uh, the issue of uh, a relationship between hospital and Maggie centers. Uh, maybe what you have been talking in the past decades, this issue of double coding, mm -hmm. uh, that one thing cannot exist by itself. Uh, I think it's almost a kind of oppositional or kind of parasitic relationship. Uh, so the one, like architects that always, we have to provide efficiency, but at the same time you want to produce a quality. So we always kind of cut in between and of course, the economy always creates that mm. uh, difficult way to uh, juggle those two issues. But is that something that you've been kind of trying to apply in this, like how to? Well, it's not me. Look, the thing is that all these architects, th there's an architectural team which chooses the architect. I, of course, very close to all that. But it's not <laughs> that these are postmodernists doing double coding. Some of them are, you know. I mean, sure, Piers Goff and Frank. But the double coding isn't part of our, uh, it's not part of the thing that we hand the architect. Mm. We give them a blueprint, and uh, that blueprint has changed and grown. You actually, it's in the back of the book. And it doesn't specify anything about communication or coding. It doesn't specify metaphor. It doesn't specify the things that I've been talking about. And those kind of things, those kind of issues, maybe come out of a dialogue with us. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we work very closely with the architect, and the architect have benefited enormously, partly from the brief, because the brief is highly defined. They can, and because they have confidence in us and we in them, they can get on with their architecture. And then, out of that, the double coding, say, of Kishu Kurokawa, where it's related to a, a galaxy. He and I discussed that, you know, yes, that was a conscious mm, discussion, dialogue. But um, we don't have a style, and we won't have a style, and, and I'm not particularly um, uh, you know, involved in, uh, I'm an architectural writer, critic, as well as, in this case, patron. But if I can't, if, if I gave the architect the brief, and then I told the architect what to do, uh, I think the architect would leave immediately. So, you know, I've got to withdraw into the background, and the architect has to breathe. And so, uh, you know, I don't think we have any stylistic uh, or ideological commitments beyond <laughs> a very strong kitchenism, a hybridism, in other words, we, you know, the, I do say that it's, it, it, ha, it ha, Maggie was very, uh, you know, she said, while well, she was still alive, and her mother said, less architecture, please. She wanted to be more like a home and comforting. If you have cancer, you don't want a big architectural statement. So it's got to be understated. You've got to creep into this thing. On the other hand, and she, <laughs> she said the most important thing in her fight with cancer was deciding to fight, you know. And it was the greatest risk she'd ever taken in life because she was given the two-month death sentence. She curled up to die. Risk-taking. And so I say to the architect, look, the cancer journey is risk-taking for, for 30 to 40 percent of the cancer patients. 30 40 to 40 percent will want to take a strong and active interest in their own therapy. For those, it's going to be a high risk. The others, 
just want amelioration, you just want to be feel better, you know, it's pastoral care and comfort. Those, that's valid too. There's no one right way to treat cancer. Can't, there's 250 kinds of cancer. There's people with all sorts of, you can't, there's it, multiple metaphors. That's the only thing <laughs> I would encourage in this, but I don't, you know, if suppose, well, you could see, I suppose, if we had, you know, with Zaha's building, I suppose it was the strongest single one, one liner, but already it's a multiple liner. Anyway, not double coding. Uh, questions from audience? Um, this is terrifically interesting, this, this theme of um, an architecture of hope. Of course it is, and the room, I guess, is full of hopeful architects. Uh, but I'm quite keen to know, um, because, because this Ma the Maggie movement is based on attracting and commissioning a very high-class, uh, well-known, iconic architects, if you like. Um, are you looking for uh, further input from them in terms of uh, a reduction in fees, for instance? Are you paying, are you paying the going rate uh, to Mr. Gary and Ms. Uh, Ms. Hadid? Um, I can see that that might be quite a, an interesting uh, thing to know about. Um, can you can you help me on that sure. one? Sure. Yep. No, all of those are valid and important questions. Um, we don't have a model uh, for the architect, and I may have intimated, uh, but it is the truth that we had no idea uh, that. Uh, to go out and commission iconic architects. You know, our first two were friends. Actually, we, we went out to find them. And um, Richard Murphy and David Page, we interviewed uh, a lot. And we didn't have any idea. It, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, excuse me for being so naive, but I hadn't, it hadn't entered our brain until Frank's incredible success. Actually, the then chairman came to me about uh, two months before and said, I think it would be good. You know, you're, you know all these architects that are quite famous, Charles, you know. And uh, I said, yeah, they're my close friends. I've, I've known Frank for 40 years, you know. My best friend in Los Angeles. So what? All right. And so my answer, I mean, I'll give you a facetious answer, but it's true, and that is, if you're an architectural critic and your best friends aren't good architects, you should practice something else, okay? Or have better friends. Anyway, I don't know. The thing is, you know, Zaha was a good friend of mine, or is a good friend of mine. Um, actually, in Zaha's case, she waived the fee entirely, okay? And in Frank's case, he waived the fee, but uh, the costs of his 40 models, because he had dreams of Maggie, you know, I told him he's my, she was my wife, not his. Um, you know, anyway, you know, he was a good, good friend. I, but he, anyway, he waived all his fees, but his sub-fees cost, cost us. Anyway, the Frank Lloyd Wright in 1936, after he designed Falling Water and the Johnson Wax 39 building, he, uh, I think Johnson Wax came in, uh, you know, a, a million or dollars or so over the budget. Meanwhile, Frank Lloyd Wright was on the cover of Time magazine, and uh, he said to Mr. Johnson, he said, who, who said, well, Frank, your building costs more than it should have. He said, look, I just made you two and a half million pounds worth of advertisement for your Johnson Wax products. He said, Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, in a way, and I think this, that's why I raised the, the question, that, and you asked the question back at me. You know, we live, and we can't not know now that iconic architecture is a genre, that iconic architects can help an institution, and maybe only a few like us, raise money. And there are very few institutions maybe like us. I don't know, it's, it's an open question, but, <coughs> um, 
and a v really valid question uh, because we don't pursue named architects necessarily. We are aware of it now. But you know we have three or four architects who you've never heard of who, who are commissioned. Uh, in Neil Gillespie in, in Scotland, who's doing a building for us, who we've had for a long time, and others who are not well known. So we don't have a policy of iconic architects or iconic buildings. That's not a policy. But um, th there's another obvious thing going on, and that is that each architect who gets one of our commissions now, it's a bit like a poison chalice, because they know they're up against the other architects. And that's why the standard hasn't gone down. It's one of the reasons, because Richard Rogers knows bloody well if he doesn't do a good job, even if he's not getting paid very much, and he waived a lot of his fees, and he gave us a building to work in, by the way, for six years. Uh, so Rogers was incredibly charitable. I, I say in the introduction, I dedicate it to the architects because, you know, we are a competitive institution, a profession, and, and we can be very bitchy uh, most of the time. But also, I think we're one of the great uh, professions which is a utopian in a, in a large way, in a way that, uh, you know, lawyers aren't and Fred the Shred is not even though he's now working for an architect, RBS. Um, I mean, sorry, not RBS. Uh, what's the name of the architect he's working for? Uh, the one who's hired Alsop. You know the big, the big firm in Scotland. Fred the Shred Goodwin, you know the man who bankrupted the Royal Bank of Scotland. Anyway, mm. um, we are a utopian profession, unlike the bankers, and that was said by the great writer, Paul Goodman. Paul and Percival Goodman, an American uh, anarchist, liberal, communist, utopians themselves, who wrote a book called Communitas about architectural plans. Very important book. And I think it bears thinking about, and that's why I dedicate the book to the architects, because you know, we are, in our good moments, we are a very collegial, uh, friendly, uh, um, idealistic uh, profession. On the other hand, of course, beware of the architect, as um, the Bible said, and as Muhammad said, the prophet said, and everybody, they spend your money, and they will ruin you. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I love the profession, and for us, it has, it really responded. So for me, it's a great victory for architecture, and it shows that we, we can do it. Um, yeah, I thought that last point about beware of the architect is quite important. Um, but given Richard Rogers is around the corner from his building and um, Richard Murphy in Scotland is around the corner from his, and actually those two seem to be the least iconic and most maybe functional and restrained, and you said how you actually got something back from Richard Rogers. So do you think the locality of the architect actually plays more of an important role than is perhaps kind of stated? And obviously kind of um, Frank Gehry kind of jumping into Dundee and then the kind of resulting building actually kind of... Yeah, interesting it's kind interesting of point. I've never thought that... But you're right. I think if you're bicycling past your building every day as Richard Rogers is, and it isn't built for the Candy Brothers, um, then, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, the thing is that uh, it's also their ideology. I think Murphy and Rogers most um, are less in the risk-taking mode, you know, and more in the service uh, mode than Gary and, and Hadid. Um, but Gary and Hadid's building uh, were not, I don't think, more expensive. They're more expressive and they're more risk-taking. Whether or not they're better or worse, <coughs> uh, I did, um, I have taken polls uh, of people in these buildings to see how much they're liked. And um, I will just tell you this. Uh, but I shouldn't really, because I think it should be private in a way. 
because certain architects' egos get excited. Anyway, uh, Richard Murphy's interior was voted the best, most uh, friendly, exci not exciting, but um, joyous, best feeling, best interior of after two other buildings had been seen. But the people I polled were architects. And we haven't done a double blind study. What I want to do, in <coughs> if, because we have about 90,000 visits now a year, and I feel, there's, I haven't talked about the big, big question, which is, does architecture make a difference? And I'll just maybe end with this little, drop this little bomb into the <laughs> discussion. <laughs> because um, remember with modernism and Richard Rogers and the whole modernist ideology was that architecture could improve society. It's what the utopian idealism of Corbusier and Mies and so on was about, Gropius. Architecture could change society. Architecture could change your life. And what was utopian statement in the 20s became in the 60s, of course, an ideology in a Marxist sense. It made more work for the architect. You could say, I've cheered up society and it's better for business. And that became stronger and stronger and stronger in the 60s and 70s. And in the school, we ran uh, debates in this space on this. We had Karl Popper and his students, you know. We had the philosophers. And uh, they would just criticize this architectural determinism. You don't know how in this space Boy, this was considered the worst form of make work. Anyway, so I, w I was against architectural determinism. And on the other hand, one of the reasons we started Mag Maggie Center is it started. Maggie and I found out, in fact, I think this is the strongest reason, to tell you the truth, was we were in California where I was a professor, UCLA, and there was a person there in San Francisco who was Dr. D uh, David Spiegel, who was running uh, tests with women who had breast cancer. And he started these informal groups. And he ran them for five or six years. And he found that on the average, the people, the, girl, the women with breast cancer who came to these sessions lived a year and a half longer <coughs> than those who didn't. Now. We, we know that if you did double-blind studies, you could say they were a self-selected group, and you can say it had nothing to do with coming to the group, et cetera, et cetera. But <clears throat> for Maggie, remember the hope. And for me, it was not the architecture of hope. It was the group dynamics of all of the things that were going on there. And I've always claimed that <clears throat> this is a hope, that we will make a difference in outcomes that you live longer. Basically, that's the bottom line. Now, <laughs> I went, because I was uh, teaching here and, and against architectural determinism, I said, of course, architecture can't change society. And it uh, can't make people live longer either. Anyway, I was on a BBC radio uh, interview with a doctor from the NHS, and he said, I said, you know, architecture doesn't change society. And he looked at me and he said, you're completely wrong. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah you know, architecture is almost the most important thing. And I said, what, what are you talking about? What had happened was we'd reversed positions. He was defending architecture and I was defending health. Anyway, he said, look, <coughs> if the building's a bad building and has and actually, Charing Cross Hospital has cancer, by the way. The building has cancer, concrete cancer. If the building's bad, we don't show up for work. I never thought of that. You know, with the biggest bureaucracy in the world, except for the Chinese army, they don't show up for work. If they don't show up for work, what happens? You don't get in the NHS for three weeks later. Architecture matters. Suddenly, I was stood on my head. So now I think I've changed my views, of course, in tune. I don't think architecture changes outcomes, but I do hope 
and that Maggie centers can make a difference uh, with uh, the architecture helping the carers, the carries helping the patients, the patients fighting, and finding out about primary things, then the whole bundle, to go back to Epidaurus, makes a difference. I do believe the whole bundle makes a difference. Anyway. Thank you very much. Okay.